My subject today is the Reformation. As I'm sure you know, the Reformation was the long process during which the Roman communion in Europe was shattered by challenges from several quarters and a number of separate Protestant churches emerged and were established. England, of course, was an important participant in these developments. In the 1530s, Henry VIII's government rejected papal authority altogether and established the Independent Church of England, and there had been stirrings of religious dissent even before that. By the end of the 16th century, most English people were Protestants. My focus is on Norwich, and in particular, the unusual course of the Reformation there. I say there because I'm over 5,000 miles away as I record this. Norwich was, of course, unusual in several ways in the 16th century. It was much larger and wealthier than any other city in England except London. All of the other urban communities around the country were considerably smaller and their residents less wealthy. And as I'll show today, Norwich also stood out for its unusually quiet reformation. My research in city archives revealed that there were definitely conflicts over religion in Norwich, but they were fewer in number and less intense than I had anticipated. And those conflicts were deliberately contained by successive generations of Norwich's magistrates who actually handled most of the religious discord that erupted in the city and who were religiously divided themselves. They did not enforce any of the Tudor religious settlements strictly. When disputes over religion did come to their attention, they rarely punished offenders as the law required if at all. They also repeatedly failed to inform higher authorities about local religious dissent. Instead, magistrates accepted a measure of spiritual diversity among Norwich's residents, thereby practicing an implicit or de facto religious toleration. I sought to try to understand and interpret the magistrate's consistent practice of downplaying religious discord at a time when some communities were gripped and overrun by such conflict. My examination of city records suggests that Norwich magistrates downplayed religious conflict so that it would not escalate and attract the attention of powerful outsiders such as the bishop or the crown. All local rulers in this period were protective of their authority and their autonomy. None relished the prospect of outside interference in their business for any reason. And disputes over religion presented an obvious potential for Episcopal or royal interference. And by the early 16th century, Norwich rulers had particular reason to worry about this kind of intervention. In the decades before the first stirrings of religious conflict, dating back to the reign of Henry VI, various governments of Norwich became entangled in disputes that resulted in royal intervention. In 1437, the Crown seized Norwich's liberties after a riot erupted, the culmination of internecine struggles among the city's rulers. The city was ruled until 1439 by men appointed by the king and not elected. Norwich lost its right to self-government again in 1443, this time for four years, as earlier internal tensions became enmeshed with wider disputes with local ecclesiastical institutions. But even in the absence of such internal strife after 1447, the danger of outside intervention remained as the city's long-standing disputes with the Norwich Cathedral Priory resurfaced in the late 15th century and continued into the 16th. The points of contention were jurisdictional and they stretched back centuries. The dispute made its way to the court of Star Chamber, where it came to the attention of Thomas Wolsey, Henry VIII's Lord Chancellor, and also the Archbishop of York, and a Cardinal of the Church. Wolsey took a personal interest in the matter and even visited Norwich himself in 1517. His intervention did little to hasten a settlement between the parties, however. In 1524, Wolsey imposed his own resolution, having become exasperated with the, with the parties, and it was a resolution one much disliked by city governors. Once again, an outsider had decided the fate of Norwich. This was a potent reminder to the city's rulers of the risk 
posed by unrestrained local conflict. Local conflict would shortly confront Norwich's magistrates with the emergence of religious disputes. From the 1530s, the city's rulers regularly encountered clashes over religion in the mayor's court. The mayor's court, staffed by the mayor and his 23 brethren aldermen, was supposed to handle secular matters only. But in practice, the residents of the city went to the mayor's court for just about all of their complaints. And so it is in the records of this court that we learn so much about the Reformation in Norwich. For example, in July 1535, six men appeared before the court to report the scandalous words of a seventh man, Thomas Miles. Miles, apparently while drunk, had loudly and publicly criticized traditional religious doctrines and ceremonies of the church. He rejected the efficacy of the priesthood, the creed, the use of images, and some of the sacraments. He called St. Peter and St. Gregory knaves, and he had even harsher words for the Virgin Mary, which I will not repeat here. These pronouncements place Miles far outside the religious orthodoxy of the time. Despite this, and despite the fact that half a dozen people had reported his remarks, Norwich magistrates took no action against Miles. They recorded no judgment, and his name never appeared in the records in connection with this incident again. Later that year, in November, the mayor's court confronted religious dissent again, but of a different kind. William Thacker, another local resident, appeared before the magistrates to criticize John Barrett, a divinity lecturer at Norwich Cathedral. It's possible that Barrett had heard uh, um, that Thacker had heard Barrett deliver a sermon there. Barrett was a close friend of the Protestant reformer John Bale and was said to have been instrumental in Bale's conversion. After complaining about Barrett's sermon, Thacker went on seemingly to warn the magistrates about the dangers of allowing suspect clergy to continue their work unchecked. Thacker declared that, and I'm quoting him here, certain preachers at London have been plucked out of the pulpit for making of their sermons. Nevertheless, the magistrates took no action against Barrett and the case disappeared from the record after that. While the mayors and aldermen usually continue this practice of ignoring or downplaying religious conflict, there were exceptions. In 1546, three men were sent to the court with the, for punishment by Sir Roger Townsend, a local gentleman. The magistrates had been compelled by Townsend to keep them in prison before their court appearance, which was an unusual step. Sir Roger had heard one of the three reading the Bible aloud to the other two in Norwich Cathedral. A recent parliamentary statute had prohibited ordinary people and most women from reading the Bible, so the three men were clearly in violation of that statute. When they, appear, when they appeared in court, they confessed their infraction and the magistrates simply released them from prison. They were never heard from again. This case was unusual for another reason. In 1539, Parliament had passed the Act of the Six Articles, which imposed a death sentence for certain religious infractions. It was a very traditional statement of religious orthodoxy at the end of Henry VIII's reign. After the passage of the Six Articles, cases of religious dissent disappeared from the court records. And clearly this one only appeared because it had been brought by this outsider, Sir Roger, because otherwise I think it's pretty clear that the magistrates would not, would not have brought it. And it's also interesting because the three men who were involved were not Norwich residents. So the case had been brought by an outsider, a gentleman, and the people that they were supposed to discipline were not even from the city. This unwillingness to punish dissidents or to punish them to the extent that the law required became a pattern that persisted through the Tudor era. In Edward VIII's reign, when the Church of England became officially Protestant for the first time, cases of religious conflict appeared more frequently in the mayor's court. The lines between Protestants and Catholics, which had been blurry in Henry VIII's reign, became sharper as Norwich's population divided over religion. But the city's magistrates still declined to enforce religious uniformity. In 1548, for example, 
the court heard a number of cases in which residents disparaged Thomas Rose, a local Protestant preacher. In addition to preaching Protestant theology, Rose had taken the provocative step of marrying, which was still prescribed in England. And so Rose was rather unpopular among some Norwich residents. A man named Jobson was ordered by the mayor's court to confess to Rose that he had said that the preacher was unfit to eat cats and dogs. But there is no indication that that confession ever took place. The following year, 1549, the mayor and aldermen heard testimony that four men had eaten a swine's cheek and a cold pie, flouting a traditional Catholic prohibition against eating meat on the day in question. They were clearly flaunting their Protestant sympathies. They did not deny the charge. Two of the four were bound to appear before the court again, although there's no record that they ever did, and no action was taken against the two others. 1549 was, of course, the year of Ketz's Rebellion. Norwich was overrun when city residents opened the gates to insurgents. The ensuing chaos resulted in a drastic reduction in all cases heard in the mayor's court. But after order was restored, the mayor and aldermen again confronted a few more cases of religious conflict, and the broad pattern reemerged. And even when the magistrates did commit a defendant to jail, as they did in one case, there was no indication that they ever carried out that sentence. By the time Edward VI died in July 1553, it was clear that Norwich was a religiously divided city. It was also clear that city governors still refused to enforce religious homogeneity. They continued to contain religious conflict and shield the city from outside intervention. The ascension of Mary Tudor to the throne of England found the magistrates taking the same approach to religious conflict. Mary was, of course, a Roman Catholic and quickly began dismantling the Protestant church established by her late half-brother. In November of 1553, the mayor's court in Norwich listened to complaints about John Wagstaff, a servant to the grocer George Walden. Wagstaff had disparaged the preaching of Thomas Tudnam, a religious conservative. He had also disparaged Mayor Henry Crook, who was also a religious traditionalist. Wagstaff and Walden were bound over to appear before the magistrates again, but neither was ever called. They also took action against a tailor named Bonner in another case when Bonner reported, when Bonner was predicted to have said that there would be trouble if there were any changes made to the Protestant church of Edward VI. The city's governors also managed to deflect potential intervention from an outsider around this time. In March 1554, they received a letter from the Duke of Norfolk, England's premier peer and a Roman Catholic. The Duke was inquiring about the activities of John Barrett, having heard that the priest was not conducting religious services according to the new Marian order and was sometimes not connect, conducting them at all. You recall that we heard about John Barrett earlier. The Duke ordered the Marian alderman to secure the priest's compliance or take, take him into custody. The magistrates replied swiftly. In a letter to the Duke, they first said that they knew that the allegations were at least partly untrue about Barrett, I think not wishing to contradict the Duke. They then claimed to have examined Barrett's parishioners who reported that the priest did actually say mass properly. Finally, the magistrates went on to say that if Barrett ever missed a service, it was only because of illness. This appears to have satisfied the Duke as the correspondence ended there. Cases of religious conflict continued to appear in the mayor's court occasionally until the beginning of what we now refer to as the Marian persecution of Protestants. In 1555, the Queen's government revived old heresy statutes, which imposed death by burning for convicted heretics. From that time until the end of the Queen's reign in 1558, disputes over religion simply disappeared from the pages of the court books. Other business continued as usual, but religious conflict was conspicuously absent. We know that religious dissent did not disappear as two Norris residents were swept into the persecution by church authorities and executed as obstinate heretics. 
is difficult to escape the conclusion that, that the absence of such cases in the court records was part of the continuing unarticulated strategy to avoid messy religious conflict, especially if it might draw in an outsider. So the Marian persecution failed to take flight in Norwich. Despite the presence of Protestants and Catholics in the city, few religious dissidents were even examined and only two were executed. This highlights the success of their years long and consistent practice of tolerating some spiritual diversity to preserve civic autonomy and civic unity in an effort to avoid outside intervention. And thus, unlike a number of other communities around England, Norwich survived the Marian persecution relatively unscathed. The Elizabethan era brought a host of change to England and of course to Norwich. The new queen who took the throne in 1558 reestablished a Protestant church. Historians now know though that it took some time for English men and women to embrace Protestantism. The records of the mayor's court show that residents of Norwich remained divided over religion. For example, over the course of a week in 1561, they heard testimony from three witnesses concerning words spoken by John Seaman. Seaman was highly critical of the clergy overall and of the new Bishop of Norwich, John Parkhurst in particular. Parkhurst was a committed Protestant who had spent Mary's reign in exile. The nicest thing that Seaman said about Parker was that he would rather listen to a chair preach than to hear the bishop do so. Magistrates took no action against Seaman. Nor did they discipline a servant named Gardner, who in 1564 had threatened to shoot a Norwich Cathedral prebendary, Nicholas Smith, with a bow and arrow. Gardner had called the priest an old papish knave. Smith's life was saved only when one Richard Tanner intervened, as Tanner later recounted to the mayor and aldermen. By taking no action, this new generation of mayors and aldermen continued the practice of containing religious dissent. It didn't matter whether someone opposed Protestants, as John Seaman did, or whether someone was critical of Catholics. The result in the mayor's court was most often the same. Magistrates did not enforce religious conformity. Now, while I focused on religious conflict here, there were other matters that concerned city leaders in the 16th century. But their ability to maintain unity helped them weather the potentially devastating conflicts that had debilitating else, uh, conflicts elsewhere in England and around Europe. And I'd be happy to talk about some other of those um, concerns and conflicts that the magistrates had. Thank you.